Well, it's day two of the trade period and we're back at the trade desk. I'm Ed and Woolley, joined by Sam McClure and Kane Corns. He's there again. How are you, gents? Yeah, really well. Looking forward to getting into day two of the trade desk. Uh, not much happening on the actual trade front, which is to be expected, Kane. But I, I guess the main player that we're still wondering, well, the main club is Collingwood, isn't it, as, as you described yesterday, but Adam Trelaw. Who's going to come late for him and, and where is his best fit if it's not Collingwood and, as we expect, it's not the Gold Coast Suns? Well, I'm not sure who's going to be, but I'm sure there will be someone that will bob up late now. Club's keeping their cards pretty close to their chest, as, as you alluded to, and you can understand why. I think they need the full picture of, firstly, you know what Collingwood are asking for in terms of a trade. Is a contracted player? Is it, is it a first-round pick? Do they want more? Or are they happy just to dump his salary? And, and could you get him for a second-round pick? That's the first point. The second part of it is how much of that massive salary are Collingwood prepared to pay? So until clubs that have an interest in him are aware of those two aspects, then I can understand why no one's coming hard for him. Where does he fit? Well, he fits in a number of clubs. I think the Western Bulldogs are, are, are quietly watching this space. I think he fits in at Hawthorne. You know, I think Carlton have probably showed their hand and, and may not be able to fit him in, but I wouldn't mind him at Carlton either. And, and the Saints are a club that have gone hard the last couple of years. And I think they would be sitting back quietly and thinking, well, if we can bring in Crouch and Trelaw in this trade period and not give away much, it's a pretty successful period that we've got. So I reckon the Saints are just sitting back and watching as well. Yeah, so that's a really interesting one, the Saints, for mine, Eton, because uh, as I'm sure you were alluding to yesterday, Kane, on your, on your various platforms, I think had the Brad Crouch deal fallen apart, and that is the Adelaide Crows matched the Saints deal, I think they would have gone chips in for Adam Trelaw, and I still wouldn't rule them out. I, I, I agree with Kane. Um, and I guess the interesting part here, Ed, and as we speak about this day in, day out, and we get closer to the trade deadline, which is late next week, as we know, I guess the question is, why would you show your hand publicly at the moment? Because you might be able to get Adam Trelaw for a steal, as, as Kane said. Yeah, it feels like with every passing day now, it's a little bit more salary Collingwood might have to fork out, or perhaps That's right. a, a lower draft pick that they're going to... Um, or guess... both, potentially. I mean, what would they have paid if he had gone to the Gold Coast Suns of the 900000 Let's just pick a, a number out, Kane, and said it, say it was 100000 The Gold Coast Suns were, mm. were still paying him 800 That might, I reckon that figure probably changes the later it goes and the different club it is, because the Gold Coast Suns probably have a lot of room and the Pies would have known that. If it's the Saints, well, they're not going to have that money to spend because of Brad Crouch and the Bulldogs won't want to spend that either. But it's fascinating the longer this goes. The Dogs are an interesting one, Kane, as you mentioned, uh, particularly given the Josh Dunkley situation because I guess if uh, he ends up at Essendon, it does open a slot in that midfield. And, and he probably offers a different dimension for them as well, Adam Trelaw, doesn't he, Kane? I think the Western Bulldogs are in the best position out of any club in this trade period. Look, they, they have well. Josh Dunkley right now, and they are saying that they are going to keep him. But the interest from Essendon gives them just an unbelievable hand in this draft. Josh Dunkley is never going to be as valuable as he is right now forever in history. So if Essendon are prepared to pay perhaps a first-round draft pick, now we think the Bombers are probably going to have six, seven and eight as it sits right now, I think they'd be prepared to give up six, seven or eight plus a second-round pick or a future second-round pick for Dunkley. If I'm the Bulldogs and I can turn Josh Dunkley into Jaden Stevenson, I think that is a massive upgrade and a massive win for them. Plus, they might get some change with that as well. So... Watch the Western Bulldogs. I think they'll be right up to their eyeballs in Trelaw and or Stevenson. And I get the feeling they'll land one of those two in this trade period. And if it can be Jaden Stevenson, I just think that's a massive win for the Western Bulldogs. So, I think he fits in there perfectly. So, Corsi, it's really interesting. We know that Stevenson and Dunkley are, are very different players, so it's hard to compare them. And, and we know that you said he was a generational talent, that being Stevenson, uh, on this program yesterday. How do you compare Dunkley and Trelaw? Two pretty different players in the way they play and also at different ends of their career. That's not to say that Trelaw is old, but he's, he's nearly 28, I think, and Dunkley's 23, already a premiership player. Who, who's the better fit and who's the better player? Yeah, well, I look at what the Western Bulldogs need and, and Dunkley works at Essendon. Don't get me wrong, I'm supportive of them going for Josh Dunkley. I think he, he, he works for them and he's what they need. But for the Western Bulldogs, they can't even get Dunkley into the midfield. That's why you saw him playing as a second ruck. He averaged 18 disposals this year and he, he couldn't get in there because of the midfielders that they've got. So why keep someone there who you're going to be used as a pretty 
uh, expensive backup ruckman and half forward when you can add some genuine goal scoring power to the Western Bulldogs forward line. I, I pair Stevenson and Norton in the front six for the Western Bulldogs. Pretty potent young forward line. Now, Dunkley's going to be 24 by the time round one comes around next year. Stevenson is three years younger. And I just think he has more upside. We know there's real limitations on Josh Dunkley's game as much as we appreciate the way he goes about it. He, he burns the footy. Um, and I just think for the Western Bulldogs and what they need, I think Jaden Stevenson is absolutely perfect. The only question, I guess, for the Western Bulldogs is the fact that they've got Jamara Eugle Hagen in the draft, potentially. Yep. And Essendon obviously got some early picks that they, they could offer for Josh Dunkley. But then do they have to offload that pick immediately for something next year to get, I guess, so they're not giving up a pick when they don't need to for yeah. in the draft? I mean, I think they're confident they'll have the points for later. I, I, I'm very confident, as I sit here today, that the Adelaide Crows will call out his name at pick one. I, I just think Justin Reid and, and the Adelaide Crows are, are the type of club that will do that to, to make the Bulldogs, you know, pay as much as they, they can. And, and good on them for doing that. On the Crows, by the way, Cornsy, I know you've been um, strong on this. I, I think they made a blue early last week by saying they wouldn't do the deal for Crouch unless it was pick two. But I think ultimately they made the right decision. I know you, you thought they should have called St Kilda's bluff, but he would have left for nothing. It's better taking 23 than nothing at all. Probably, but I, I just uh, I would be frustrated if I was a Crows fan that they continually get walked over. So you give up two first round draft picks for Bryce Gibbs, who's a lot older and a different stage than Brad Crouch. Yet you're happy to accept pick 23. And I'm more critical of the way they handled it. You know, I'm a Crows fan. I just can't trust anything that comes out of their mouth. They were emphatic that they were going to match this deal. They said that publicly through the key people in Adam Kelly and Mark Rusciuto. And then they don't. So, so what the Crows tell you, they don't do. And if I was a Crows fan, you know, you get pick 12 for Charlie Cameron. That's not market rate with what Charlie Cameron has done. You get pick nine for Dangerfield. That's not market rate. And I can guarantee you pick 23, which will turn into 26 or 27, is absolutely not market rate for their best midfielder. So they've been walked over. They continually get walked over. And I think they're seen as a pushover when it comes to trade time. Yeah, I... I disagree with that. I think there's a difference between being a pushover and just making the wrong call. I completely understand what, what Cornsey's saying. Um, they, they just huffed and puffed way too much last week, and they've done that as a footy club before, and it, ha it hasn't worked. So I, I thought they would have learned their lesson, but ultimately, I think that they've got 23, they move on, and, um, and they won't be happy with it, but good clubs move on quickly. It feels like a pragmatic call, but I guess Dangerfield too. It felt like the climate was maybe different to now. When we, I agree. With, with free agency and particularly yep. we've seen now with what GWS are, are doing with Jeremy Cameron. But at what, what is the decision they make? At some point, do they have to, to keep someone like a Crouch when perhaps there is the risk of a, a five-year contract cane? Because that is a big risk in itself, isn't it? I guess holding on to a guy that you don't really want as well. Yeah, and I guess it's more about the way you go about it. And, and I, I love what the Giants have done by matching... Geelong's bid for Jeremy Cameron. Now, it doesn't come without any pain. I'm not sure they want to pay him the 900 in the five or six years that he's on offer, but at some point they've made a stand and thought, well, we're not just allowing the best forward in the game to walk to a grand finalist and we'll cop pick 12. So they made a stand. Crows said they were going to make a stand and then they rolled over. So congratulations to the Saints. I thought if they were playing poker, they absolutely cleaned up against the Crows yesterday. They certainly did. Well, just on Adelaide, there has been a trade today, Sam. It yes. was a little earlier in the day, so I might leave the phone we'll down. leave the there. phone down on the hook. <laughs> but Kyle Hardigan going to Hawthorne, and it was done as a trade rather than as, a, I guess, a free agency deal, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So people get a little bit confused um, around this time of year with free agency, and it can be because the rules uh, are a little bit misleading sometimes. But uh, he went for a future fourth round that he could have left as an unrestricted free agent, but... The Hawks have already got compensation for Isaac Smith, so they didn't want that compensation to be affected. So they decided to do a trade because ultimately the compensation comes down to who leaves and who comes in um, the door at, from your footy club in one particular trade period or free agency period. You might remember back to when Carlton got Dale Thomas, but in the same year that they lost Eddie Betts. So the compensation works both ways. Well, gents, thanks for your time again. We'll see you tomorrow for day three. It'll be then. Hopefully we get a few, bit more trade action on the way, but thanks again for your time. Thanks, Gordy.